we're going to get into some of the dietary causes in just a minute, but like um, beyond, you know, we're talking about, you kind of hinted at this earlier, insulin has many roles. And oftentimes the general public thinks about its role in just regulating blood glucose levels. Mm -hmm. But maybe you could just talk about some of the other roles insulin plays, for example, yeah. in fat accumulation. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we've al I've already touched on a few. Like, for example, who would have imagined that insulin regulates the enzyme that's responsible for the conversion of testosterone to estrogens, for goodness sake? And yet it does. Insulin has a direct inhibitory role on aromatase, that enzyme that mediates the conversion and the synthesis of estrogens in men and women. It also regulates nitric oxide production, regulating dilation of blood vessels, and other hormones throughout the body that affect water retention, salt signaling, neuron conductant of, of signals, and, and more. But when the, at the fat cell, insulin probably has its most um, powerful effect, where the, you cannot under... Now, we're touching on a broader topic of why do we get fat here, and, and I'm, I welcome that topic. Uh, in fact, of all the human tissue I've studied the most in my lab, it's fat tissue that we've when we we started doing fat biopsies in my lab a few years ago, and that's the tissue we study the most. So I'm very comfortable talking about adipose tissue physiology. There is as much as there is the debate in two camps of what makes fat cells grow, it's just purely a matter of thermodynamics, or no, it's purely a matter of endocrinology. The truth is, of course, you actually have to have both. You cannot, under any circumstance, make a fat cell get big unless you have both. Just to make a put a fine point on that, if you have all the calories in the world, so I grow fat cells in in petri dishes in my lab right now. Back at BYU, I got students growing fat cells in the incubator. Um, they are swimming in a culture medium filled with calories. Everything the fat cell needs is all the calories that fat cell could ever want are around it right now. And yet they're teeny little cells. They're not getting big at all until we add one thing. And the moment we add insulin into that culture, now the fat cells start to get big. If we check them six hours later, there's a big lipid droplet. Six hours still later, it's even bigger. So in other words, the fat cell knows what to do with the energy that it has access to. A cell doesn't have any kind of intuitive intellect to think, okay, there's calories here, or more accurately, carbons that I can turn into triglycerides, and I'm going to take them in and store them. But in the context of the body, the fat cell needs to know, am I playing nice with the rest of the body? How stupid would it be if we got up and went extra, we go out on a jog outside our fat cells are breaking down triglycerides as free fatty acids by activating lipolysis, and yet at the same time, they're pulling them right back in to store them. That would be stupid. The fat cell wants to cooperate well and be part of the orchestra of the, of the body, and so it will be releasing its fat so that the muscle can take it up. But if insulin were elevated, so insulin acts as the signal, basically, telling the fat cell when it's time to eat and when it's time to share. So... To, to, and then let's, if we flip it, in fact, actually, I'll stay there for one more second. We even see this. Someone could say, well, Ben, that's just uh, in fat cells. What about humans? In fact, humans provide the most convincing evidence of all that you cannot get fat unless insulin is elevated because one of the more common eating disorders among young people with type 1 diabetes is a condition called diabulimia, which is this terrible, tragic scenario where the person feels such pressure to be lean and they have learned that that little syringe of insulin is the absolute gatekeeper of the fat cell. So they will deliberately underdose their insulin in order to stay as thin as they want. They can eat as much as they want. And as long as they underdose their insulin, and it's not even at zero, they're just doing a deliberately lower dose, they will be as skinny as they want. Now, there's metabolic hell to pay, right? They're hyperglycemic. They're getting into ketoacidosis. So they're dying but they'll be as thin as they want. So as much as people want to say, no, it's just calories, we have a human case study that absolutely proves that wrong, that it's not just calories. Now, having said all that, I'm not claiming calories don't matter because on the other hand, if you just have high insulin in the absence of sufficient calories coming in, that's also incompatible with life and the person will die. Because if you, if you and I were fasting, in fact, Dr. George Cahill did these studies about 40 years ago. You could never get IRB approval to do it now. He would fast men for days and then give them an insulin dose. 
and drive their glucose levels down to about 20 milligrams per deciliter just to see how low could the glucose get and the person maintains consciousness. And they did. But suffice it to say, if you spike insulin, which is telling the body to store energy, but there's not energy coming in, then the total energy available in the blood drops to essentially zero. Glucose goes down to zero. Ketones go to zero. Fatty acids go to zero because you're, you're inhibiting lipolysis. You're inhibiting ketogenesis. You're stimulating glucose uptake. Now the brain has no energy because it doesn't have a reserve of energy like the liver or the fat cells or the muscle. And so as blood energy goes to essentially zero, the brain shuts off. So coming back to the fat cell, you have to have both. You have to have elevated insulin sufficient to tell the fat cell to store that energy, but then you have to have the energy to store. So calories matter, but so too does the insulin stimulus because in the absence of the insulin stimulus, there is no such thing as fat storage. And indeed the body can't stop breaking down the fat. And in fact, that's what ketones are. Ketones are nothing more than sign, a, a sign of the liver burning a lot of fat where it's burning so much fat, it has such an abundance of acetyl-CoA that it can it can no longer feed the acetyl-CoA into the citrate cycle because it's too full. It cannot divert it to lipogenesis because insulin's low, so that pathway's inhibited or not activated. And then the only other option of all that acetyl-CoA is ketogenesis. So ketones are simply sort of this overflow, this metabolic release valve of, of fat burning. But they go one step further, if you'll allow me, where how do we then reconcile it? What is it about insulin? Like if in, I'm not saying calories don't matter. I'm not trying to break the laws of thermodynamics. In fact, my PhD is bioenergetics. I have a unique appreciation for energy in organisms so that it, those, those carbons need to be accounted for. But the more insulin is low, uh, you have two adaptations that allow the body to stay lean or to not store that excess as uh, excess that they're eating as fat, which is one, a higher metabolic rate by several hundred calories a day when insulin goes down. As, so the body's just burning a little hotter. Uh, the, the engine is revving higher. So the overall energy expenditure is up again by two to 500 calories a day. And when you're in ketosis, you're eliminating ketones through the breath and the urine. And every ketone that a person's breathing out or urinating out has a caloric value roughly similar to glucose. So you're just excreting calories from the body. So the net effect of all of that can be up to 800 or so calories a day that the person's just wasting.